This is the integer lattice. It's the set of all integer coordinates visualized such that the coordinates lie at the intersections of the lines on a grid. Each point is uniquely defined by an ordered pair of integers. These are primitive lattice triangles. The definition of a primitive triangle is such that all the corners of the triangle are located on lattice points, and there are no other lattice points on or within the boundary of the triangle. This isn't a primitive triangle, since there is a lattice point on the boundary of the triangle, which isn't at a corner. This isn't a primitive triangle either, since it has a lattice point in its interior. In this video, we'll show that all primitive triangles have an area of one half. This is an important result that can be used in proofs of other theorems such as Pick's theorem. In some cases, it's quite easy to see this as true. These triangles clearly take up half of a square with sides of length 1, and given that the area of a triangle is a half base times height, the area of these triangles will be one half. In some cases, the triangles might be stretched along some axis, but with a little bit of thought, we can see that the base and the height are still one, again given an area of one half. In some cases, however, it's not really that obvious what the area will be, and so a general proof is needed. We'll break down the proof into three stages. First, rather than considering triangles, it's easier to double the triangle to form a parallelogram and prove that all primitive parallelograms have an area of one. To achieve this, in part two, we'll find a suitable transformation of our parallelogram in which the area stays the same, but makes things easier for us to reach part three. In part three, we'll finally show that the parallelogram has a base and a height of one, and so has an area of one. Therefore, the original triangle, which was a half of a parallelogram, has an area of one half. Before we start though, I want to introduce visible points on the integer lattice. We say that the point MN is visible if there are no other lattice points on the line segment connecting 0, 0 and MN. The point 3, 2 is therefore a visible point since the line from 0, 0 to 3, 2 doesn't pass through another lattice point. The point 2, 2 is not a visible point since the line from 0, 0 to 2, 2 passes through the point 1, 1. The point MN is visible if and only if M and N are co-prime, that is, they don't share a common factor greater than 1. For example, if we have a visible point MN, it's easy to see that the point 2M 2N isn't visible since we've already gone through the point MN. And the reason I'm telling you this is because we're going to use this really nice fact about co-prime numbers. If m and n are co-prime, then there exist integers p and q such that pm plus qn is equal to 1. For example, let m equal 5 and n equal 9. Then we find 2 times 5 plus minus 1 times 9 equals 1. Here p is 2 and q is minus 1. Consider a primitive triangle. Since translation doesn't affect its area, we can let one corner be at the origin. The other two corners we'll call MN and IJ. Note that by definition, these are visible points. Now, consider these points as vectors. Adding them together gives a parallelogram with the fourth corner located at M plus I, N plus J. This is still a visible point, since the line between here and the origin necessarily goes through the line separating the two primitive triangles, and not through a corner point, otherwise the vectors MN and IJ would be parallel. Here's where the result about co-prime integers comes in. We can write down a matrix PQ minus N M, and from the above result its determinant is 1. Applying a matrix transform to a given shape might stretch it and or rotate it, but if the matrix has a determinant of 1, its area won't change. This means we can apply our matrix transform to our parallelogram, knowing the resulting parallelogram has the same area. Also, since parallel lines remain parallel under a matrix transform, the parallelogram remains primitive. 
The point Mn under the transform becomes Pm plus Qn, which is 1 by definition, and minus Nm plus Mn, which is 0. Of course, the point 0, 0 is unchanged by the matrix transform. We can also work out where the other two points get transformed to. Right now, we don't know the exact values, so don't pay too much attention to how I've shown this. We know only two things. The y-coordinates of the two points are equal and not zero, since that would give us an area of zero, and the x-coordinates are separated by one. What I want to show is that given that this is a primitive parallelogram, its height is necessarily one. This would imply it has an area of one, and so would complete our proof. We'll use proof by contradiction and show that if the height is greater than one, our parallelogram can't be primitive. Hence, since we know it is primitive, the height must not be greater than one. Okay, so let's suppose the height of the parallelogram is greater than one. In this case, you can see that there is a point in the interior of the parallelogram and so it's not primitive. In this case, we see there are two points on the boundary of the parallelogram, again making it not primitive. And in general, what you'll find is that as you pass through the line y equals 1, since the width of the parallelogram along the x-axis is 1, you'll always find at least one integer point on or within the boundary. It's equivalent to saying that a closed interval on the real line whose length is greater than or equal to 1 always contains an integer. Therefore, the height of our transformed primitive parallelogram is necessarily 1, and so all primitive parallelograms have an area of exactly 1. And going back to where we started, since our parallelogram was just two primitive triangles stuck together, we can conclude that all primitive triangles have an area of one half. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.